MZTV. Yeah, I suppose I should follow up on what I said yesterday about homosexuals. Was that shocking? No, I'm not going to make a whole show on it. I want to continue in uh, Romans uh, chapter 8 with the allotment uh, situation because that's confusing to a lot of people. So let's go ahead. And this is Martin Zender, by the way. Welcome to MZTV in Romans chapter 1. Paul talks about giving them over. That is people of the world. Therefore, God gives them over. Well, okay. Go to the context. This is just briefly. I'm touching on this for the sake of some people who were confused yesterday. And just a quick overview is that there's there's nothing against women lying with women in the scriptures. In other, in other words, there's no such thing as female homosexuality in the scriptures. I mean, I know there's such a thing as women who are attracted to women, but in the scriptures, it's only men with men. And it's only men with men in the issue of penetration. Only that one act. And you'll find from Leviticus chapter 20, almost all the sexual sins have to do with penetration. And women cannot penetrate one another and no toys don't count. So we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, 22, alleging themselves to be wise, they are made stupid, and they change the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of an image of a corruptible human being and flying creatures and quadrupeds and reptiles. Wherefore, God gives them over in the lusts of their hearts to the uncleanness of dishonoring their bodies among themselves, those who alter the truth of God into the lie and are venerated and offer divine service to the creature rather than the creator. By the way, offering divine service to the creature rather than the creator, that, inclu that includes people who believe in free will. That is offering divine service to the creature. It puts the creature in charge of the creature's own salvation. It puts the creature in charge of the creature's future. Because it's the creature that decides, independently of God, what he or she or it will do. That is venerating and giving divine service to the creature rather than to the creator. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, a form of idolatry. Free will is idolizing the human. It is. Well, if you go back to verse... 23, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of an image of an image of a corruptible human being. There you go. They make a corruptible human being, a corruptible human being who is dead in trespasses and sins. They make this person, this individual, actually higher than God in that this corruptible human being is able to make God-like decisions. That is deciding where he or she or it will spend eternity that is changing the glory of the corrupt incorruptible god into the likeness of an image of a corruptible human being that is idolatry people who believe in free will are idolaters no they're not offering their children up to moloch it's far more subtle than that or is it or is it they're actually giving Divine service, that is, giving divine attributes to corruptible human beings. If I were to tell you that uh, the belief in a rock for s salvation, if I were to tell you, a Christian, that that counts for saving faith, if you believe in a rock for your salvation, they would l be vehemently against that. They would say, no, that's not possible. I said, what's the difference between believing that a rock can save you and believing that a corruptible human being can save there's no difference in the ability to save between a rock and a corruptible human being. The corruptible human being is weak, unable, infirm. As weak, unable, and infirm as the rock. It's a little trickier, though, because, of course, the human being is animated. It doesn't look as though it's helpless, but it's just as helpless as a rock. You might as well believe in a rock for salvation if you're going to believe in a corruptible human being. There's no difference. Any Christian out there would call a rock worshiper an idolater. Well, 
Look in the mirror, Christians, because you're also on idolatry because you are putting your confidence in yourself. Not only that, but you are making yourself to be the final deciding factor of your salvation. In fact, you are promoting the self in the matter of salvation. You are promoting the self above the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross was not enough, according to you. It was not enough to finish the job. What finishes the job? A corruptible human being. And therefore, you, human free will believers, put the corruptible human being, I was going to say on par with God, but no, if only. You put the corruptible human being above God. Because 1 Timothy 2, 4, God wills all humanity to be saved and to come to a realization of the truth. But if the almighty corruptible human being wills not to be saved, then the will of the almighty incorruptible, uh, no, actually corruptible human being, trumps the will of God. That's what you believe. If anybody is listening to my voice who still believes in human free will, you are an idolater. And you are putting the corruptible human being. You're, you're in this category of Romans. You're not in the body of Christ. If you believe that a corruptible human being is able to save itself, it's no different than putting your confidence in a stone idol. Knowing God, not as God, do they glorify or thank him? The Christians don't glorify or thank God as God. He's the one who merely gave them the opportunity to save themselves. And yet they're corruptible human beings. But they reject that message vehemently. They hate that message because their confidence is completely in themselves. And God describes them perfectly here. In verse 21 of Romans chapter 1, knowing God, not as God do they glorify or thank him. They glorify him, they thank him in all their worship songs, but not as God. They, quote, glorify him and, quote, thank him as a happy little helper who paved the way for them to enact their salvation, therefore becoming their own saviors. And yet they're hypocrites because they claim that Jesus Christ saved them. But that is total hypocrisy. How did Jesus Christ save you if you're born condemned? Jesus Christ did his amazing work on the cross 2,000 years ago, and yet people are born condemned? People are born with a default setting, bound to hell? Unless they... Make the right decision, go to the right church, say the right prayer. You're idolaters. Repent or, you know, see at the great white throne. Repent is change your mind. Isn't that weird? You tell people, you Christians tell people to repent, repent. And in your mind, their repentance involves them turning from whatever else they're doing and having confidence in, a, in their corruptible self. And you're engaging people in attention, not to the cross of Christ, but to the corruptible human being, because that's where the salvation lies. And you play organ music to try to wake up the corruptible human being. And you give inspired oratory, trying to wake up the corruptible human being, trying to inspire the corruptible human being. Listen to what I'm saying. Wake up, a corruptible human being, inspire, a corruptible and corrupted and dead in trespasses and sin and helpless and infirm human being. You're trying to rouse and raise someone who is dead in trespasses in sins, who is not seeking out God, who, who is not righteous. Who has you engaged in this enterprise? The evil one. The adversary, Satan, has you engaged in this enterprise. That's the essence of all religion. Take your attention away from God's accomplishments and to put it on the human. You're doing that big time. You're putting all the attention on the human, on the human's capability, on the human's worthiness. All your programs are to prop up the corpse of the old humanity and your idolaters. And you who would condemn 
the homosexuals of the world, and you who would condemn every other category of sin you can think of, and even categories of sin that you've invented, while you're condemning others, you yourselves are condemned by this passage. And if you really understood Romans 1, you would understand that Paul's mission here is to condemn everybody, the non-religious and the religious person alike, the worldly person and the church person, in order to shut up all humanity before he announces the cross, before he announces what happened because of the faith of Christ in Romans 3.21. Yet now, apart from law, a righteousness of God is manifest, not a righteousness of humans, of churchgoers, of worthy people, of people who behave themselves. No, but a righteousness of God, of Jesus Christ's faith for all and on all who are believing. So be careful if there are any Christians out there condemning others, especially the homosexuals. They have... Their sin, even those among that community who are sinning, and it is very small percentage because the women aren't even sinning. Women cannot sin by lying with each other because there can be no penetration. In the scriptures, there is no such thing as female homosexuality. And even the males who are attracted to each other, they're not even sinning until they put that in there. But even that is covered by the grace of God. But self-righteousness? Self-righteousness causes one to, as Paul says in Galatians, fall out of the grace of God. You fall out of the sphere where the grace of God operates because you don't think you need it. That's why the sinner went home justified in Jesus' parable. The publican, the sinner, and the Pharisee. The sinner said, oh, Lord, be merciful to me. I'm terrible. I'm weak. I, I, I'm helpless. And the Pharisee said, I thank God that I'm not like these other people. What does that sound like? Who does that sound like? It was the sinner that went home justified. It was the sinner that tapped into the grace of God. The grace of God reaches the self-righteous ultimately because Jesus Christ is the Savior of all humanity. But as far as Aeonian life goes, as far as an allotment in the kingdom, as far as seeing the light of day before the great white throne judgment, if you're a Christian and you believe in human free will, you're out. You're out. And the homosexuals are going to be in the kingdom before you are. So be careful. Alleging themselves to be wise. Oh, yeah, well, God, gets it pretty, God has it pretty much knocked down here. Vain were they made in their reasonings and darkened is their unintelligent heart. Vain were they made in their reasonings. The Christian mind, the Christian excuses, the Christian reasonings. Well, I'm independent of God. God's given me this realm of independence. Where? Prove it. You have one proof first? No, you have no proof first. I got 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50 proof versus that you don't have an independence from God. Independence from God is impossible. You have verses that show me humans doing things and acting things, but you have no proof that they're doing it independently of God, yet you claim that the human is truly independent of God. Alleging themselves to be wise, they are made stupid, and they change the glory of their incorruptible God into the likeness of a corruptible human being. Okay, let's go on from there. Wherefore, God gives them over in the lust of their hearts to the uncleanness of dishonoring their bodies among themselves. Those who alter the truth of God into the lie and are venerated and offer divine service to the creature rather than the creator who is blessed for the eons. Amen. Therefore, God gives them over to dishonorable passions. Now, not all of them will be given over to the same dishonorable passions. The desire to please God is a dishonorable passion. I should say this. The desire to please God in that one, in the sense that one believes one is independently pleasing God and that God is laissez-faire, God is hands-off, and God is giving the human the opportunity to show him what they can do. If one is seeking to please God out of a supposed strength of flesh, out of a supposed 
self-worthiness or self-righteousness then. That doesn't count. And that is a dishonorable passion. That is a spiritually dishonorable passion. Now I'm going to tell you about a physically, uh, two physically dishonorable passions. For their females, besides, alter the natural use into that which is beside nature. Where do you hear in that description an account of females lying with females? Females being intimate with other females. You have to read into it. It's not there. You have to read into it. And even if you look into the toughest law of the land, the law of Moses, in Leviticus chapter 20, you go through the list of sexual sins, and that's where they're all listed. And right where you're supposed to see it, right where it should be, females lying with females, it's absent, conspicuously absent. It speaks volumes by its omission. It's not there, and neither is it here. What's Paul talking about then? Dishonorable passions for their females alter the natural use. Alter the natural use of what? The natural use of their sexual organ. Into that which is beside nature. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. It's got to be women lying with other women. How would that be altering the natural use? The natural use of the female sexual receptacle is for the receipt of the male sexual organ that's the natural use but these females in this passage are altering the natural use and doing that which is beside nature what are they doing they're having sex with animals if i have to be graphic about it that was one of the sexual sins listed in leviticus that's what paul's referring to here but now let's talk about the males Likewise, the males, besides, that is, besides what the females are doing, the males are doing something besides that. Leaving the natural use of the female were inflamed in their craving for one another, males with males effecting indecency and getting back in themselves retribution of their deception, which must be. This is speaking of the disease that comes about when men put that in there. They're inflamed in their craving for one another. And if you go back, it doesn't say this about the female. It doesn't say they're inflamed in their craving for one another. No. You can't carry that backward from the description of what the males are doing into the females because the females aren't doing that. The females are doing something else. They're altering the natural use. The men are inflamed in their craving for one another. You see the difference? Again, I'm in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And if you read about the sexual sins in Leviticus chapter 20, you will read about men lying with other men as lying with women. It's about penetration. That's it, okay? And as I read to you yesterday, I'll get to the topic of the day finally at the end of this video. Those who are sodomites or catamites, the sodomite is the male giver, the catamite is the male receiver. They're not enjoying an allotment of God's kingdom. These are serial sodomites, serial catamites. They're not people who have a, some occasional crazy fling, got drunk, and, oh, what the hell happened there? Oh, I'm not going to do that again. Good, don't. Don't. Again, if there are any males in my audience who feel the desire for other males, you can be intimate with another male. I mean, in some ways, we're a homophobic society, and Males used to, I think, show affection for one another, natural affection for one another that today would be looked upon as homophobic. But back in the day, it wasn't. Men could sleep together without being accused of being homosexuals. In Italy, men kiss each other, right? Mwah, mwah. So there is, you know, some people feel the need to do more than that. Just don't put that in there. Can you not do that? I think you can. I think you can resist that. I think there's other things you can substitute. I think. I don't know. This is not my area of expertise as far as that realm. But I think you're very creative out there.
So I told you I had a parallel passage in Romans 8. I wouldn't tell you if I didn't have it. I do have it. And here it is. Paul says, The Spirit itself, I'm in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself is testifying together with our spirits that we are children of God. Yet, if children, enjoyers of an allotment. Here's the allotment coming in. But there are different allotments. Listen to this now. Enjoyers indeed of an allotment from God, yet enjoyers of Christ's allotment, if so be that we are suffering together, that we should be glorified together also. So there is a special allotment to be had for those who suffer together with Christ. And I can't think of any other way this can be done except for someone who is persecuted for their legitimate faith or their working in the word and they're suffering some sort of persecution because of their work in the word or they're suffering some sort of uh, lack because of that but the spirit is testifying that we're children of god that's the basic truth of everyone in the body of christ so if your children enjoyers also of an allotment Enjoyers a deed of an allotment from God. So the allotment from God is different, I believe, than the allotment spoken of in 1 Corinthians 6, the enjoying the allotment of God's kingdom. The word kingdom is in there in 1 Corinthians 6. Those who will not be enjoying an allotment of God's kingdom. And I listed all those career sinners yesterday. They're still covered by grace and that they're in the body of Christ. But God recognizes workers he recognizes those within the body of Christ who suffer. And he also recognizes those in the body of Christ who have bad teaching. Their teaching is going to be burned up at the dais. He also recognizes those in the body of Christ who are career sinners. And it's all going to be dealt with fairly. Everybody's still in the body of Christ, which is, is winning the lottery. It's the absolute cream of the human crop. All because of the sovereign choosing of God before the disruption of the world. This is irrespective of anything anybody does. But now we're talking about an allotment. Okay, well, everybody in the body of Christ has a particular allotment. But it's in here, in, in Romans 8, it's not associated with a kingdom. Whenever you're speaking of kingdom, you're talking about rule. But in this section of Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit itself testifying together with our spirits that we're children of God. This is general basic salvation yet if children enjoyers also of an allotment enjoyers indeed of an allotment from god yet here's something more yet joint enjoyers of christ's allotment Ooh, how do i get that i want i want to be a i just don't want an allotment from god as great as that is i'm going to be joint enjoyers of christ's allotment which i believe is spoken of again in another way in first corinthians 6 speaking of the allotment of god's kingdom and that comes by suffering together and there's an added glory being glorified together also we're all going to be glorified as members of the body of christ but as in israel there are better resurrections again i've told you when i saw that in hebrews about a better resurrection why are these people going about the earth and they're being, they're being uh, spit on and they're being shoved to the margins of society? They're going about in goat skins and the world's not worthy of them. They're looking for a better resurrection. A better resurrection? I thought resurrection was resurrection. Oh, no, it's not. No, 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 it's not. It's the greatest thing going. And membership in the body of Christ, our allotment, our general allotment under God is even better than Israel's allotment. Because our realm is inherent among the celestials. But even in that allotment, ladies and gentlemen, there is an allotment of God's kingdom and there is a sharing of Christ's allotment. One is related to suffering with Christ. And we find this again in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I've been there before. I suppose I, I could go there. And one is associated with just avoiding, just not being a chronic career 
sinner of the worst kind. And if you are a chronic career sinner of the worst kind in the sins I mentioned yesterday, grace covers you. I accept you as a brother and a sister. Even if you're sacrificing your children to Moloch, I don't see how that could be completely consistent, but technically it could be consistent with believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believe it or not, I've been criticized for accepting too many people in the body of Christ. I thought I was the guy that says, nope, you believe in the Trinity? Sorry, you're out because you don't believe in the death of Christ. What? You believe in free will? <laughs> you're out because you don't believe in the death of Christ for sin. You think you eliminate your sin by believing in Christ. I'm like a tough guy for that. Yet people are getting after me recently for accepting you know, the recent controversy we've had. It's not a controversy. Again, of course, it's truth versus a sect, but those who don't believe in the pre-existence of Christ. Membership in the body of Christ is decided by Paul via God in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The death of Christ for sin. That's how that's decided. I'm just a guy standing next to the stick that either gets you on the roller coaster or doesn't get you on the roller coaster. I didn't invent the stick. I'm just holding it. Sorry, you're not tall enough. Sorry. You're not believing things that belong to Aeonian life. So if you have a hankering for an Aeonian allotment, um, stop being a career criminal, an extortioner. Stop being an idolater or a career adulterer or a sodomite or a catamite or a career greedy person or a career drinker. Just stop it if you can. Uh, that would be great. But if you can't, you're my brother, you're my sister in Christ, and you're accepted into the body of Christ apart from your acts by grace. But for those who have a hankering for something more, for a better resurrection, it can be had. It can be yours if the price is right. <laughs>